Ecology is basically um, a study of how organisms um, interact with each other and their environment. Okay, so it's that that interconnectedness. Um, basically, all organisms will interact with other organisms in their surroundings and the environment. No one is an island. You don't live by yourself. You interact with other living organisms, even if you don't realize it. So um, we're going to go from the broadest to the smallest um, with the levels of organization. The biosphere is the most inclusive, which means it includes the most things. And that's going to be um, basically the earth and the atmosphere. So you can see um, in these pictures here, this is the biosphere. Um, the ecosystem is, uh, then we have actually a biome, which is it's not listed here. But a biome is just like a different environment. So you could have um, like a grassland would be in a biome or a rainforest, um, something like that. A coral reef. Maybe the ocean example. Um, an ecosystem is then all of the organisms and the non-living environment found in a particular place. So the ecosystem is kind of like a biome, but it's a little, um, it's a little smaller. It's not going to be as large of an area. Um, the community is a group of various species that live with one another. Okay, and they live within the ecosystem. And then a population is um, all of the member species that live in one place at one time. So these are all the same species. Um, so you can't have like a, a population that includes like turtles and lizards. Um, you would have a turtle population and a lizard population. And then the very smallest is the individual. That's that, that, one, that one critter. Um, so ecosystem components, we have biotic factors, and these are living things that affect an organism or something that was previously living. That's why I have this picture here, because um, this desk is made out of wood, um, and wood was previously living. So this desk, as long as it's real wood, and not like, you know, like plastic wood, um, it would be, it would be um, previously living, it would be considered biotic. Um, I'm writing on my iPad. Right now, my iPad would be considered abiotic because it was, it's not alive now and it didn't used to be alive. It's basically made of like plastic and metals and stuff. So I'm going to talk about producers and consumers. I know you guys have been making food webs this week. I think you made um, Antarctic food webs. Um, so a producer is an autotroph. That's someone that can make their own food. Okay, so, um, so let's see. Um, this would be a producer. This is a plant. This would be a producer. This is also a plant. Um, consumers are heterotrophs. They are things that cannot make their own food. Okay, and then we can talk about primary and secondary. For example, um, things that eat plants are called primary consumers, so I'll call those BCs. So like uh, this guy, he's getting energy from the plant, so he's a primary um, consumer. Um, this guy's getting energy from plants, he's a primary consumer. And this squirrel is getting energy from plants, so he's a primary consumer. If you're getting something that gets energy from plants, if you're getting energy from something that gets energy from plants, then you're a secondary consumer. So I'll call those SCs, because so, he's getting this frog, is eating the grasshopper who ate the plant. The rabbit um, is a primary consumer. I can see him still up high. Now the snake is eating the primary consumer, so he's a secondary consumer right here. Um, same with this, this mouse. I'm gonna actually um, see if I can erase this part. And I'm gonna call him a primary consumer here, but I'm gonna call him a secondary consumer here because he's eating something that ate plants. Okay, right here on this side, the fox would be called a, um, a tertiary cons cons well, he's, he's a secondary consumer on this side, right? If you go from here, it would be a tertiary consumer. And then um, the squirrel's a primary consumer, so the squirrel to the fox would be a secondary consumer. 
but then the um, the plant to the grasshopper to the mouse to the um, fox would be the tertiary. Then we can have this owl right here. He's a tertiary consumer. Um, and then right here we have secondary. This would be a tertiary consumer right here. And then this way, primary, secondary, this owl would be a tertiary consumer. And a lot of times you won't have much higher than a tertiary consumer on land because um, if you talk about like the 10% rule, you only have 10% of the energy going from each level. And so you can only go so high before, you know, that, that level is so high. It's not getting enough energy from that initial level to support it. So you usually don't get much higher than tertiary. Um, or an herbivore is something that is going to eat plants. A carnivore is something that eats meat. And an omnivore eats plants and meat. So for example, this, um, this mouse was an omnivore because he ate plants and he ate things that ate plants. He ate animals. Um, and then a trinivore is something that eats dead things. It's a decomposer. So now we can talk about the energy flow through ecosystems. Um, each trophic level is a, um, is a step in the transfer of energy. So for example, this would be a trophic level. This is a trophic level. This is one. And the reason they have these uh, triangles is because you, know, you have the most energy at the bottom. And then 10% of the energy that's available on the bottom gets transferred up. Right, and then 10% of that energy gets uh, transferred up, so that's 1%. And then 10% of that energy gets transferred up, so that's like 0.1%. And then 10% of that energy gets transferred up, and that's 0.01%. So you can see very quickly, that's why it's hard to go much higher because um, because you're starting to get a very small amount of the energy that was available at that, you know, that first level. And that's, that's that 10% rule that you have right here. Um, a food chain is showing the energy flow from one level to the next. You know, plankton eat crustace or crustacean eat plankton, herring eat small crustaceans, um, mackerel eat herring, and the shark eats the mackerel. You know, it's, um, a, a food chain is going to go right in a row. I mean, it's always going to go in the direction of energy flow. Now, a food web, that's something that's a little more realistic, right? You might have this lower level, and then that person eats that thing, and that eats that, but then you know, this could eat that, and then this you know, could eat that, but then that's going to, you know, something like that. Um, that's a little more realistic. Some of these um, food chains can actually almost look like a plate of spaghetti. They're so messy. Um, because, and sometimes we, a lot of times, we don't necessarily know exactly how the food web works, we could miss something in the food web because we're not paying attention, you know, to every level. We might not know all of the part, how all of the parts. Are. So predation is when one organism kills another for food, and the prey is the thing that is being killed. Um, and then competition is two or more species vying for the same resource. resource. So um, what is this like a hawk or an owl or something? Um, it's eating a fish, right? Well, it's entirely possible that there's maybe an eagle um, also wants to eat this fish, right? And so the eagle and there's a, there's a hawk, a bull, um, might compete with um, the bird in this picture um, for that fish prey. Okay, so the um, this large bird would be the predator. And this fish would be the prey. Now let's see, say that this fish eats even smaller fish. Okay, let's say these little fish I'm drawing are the fish that this one eats. Then in this interaction, right, the one between big fish and this one, the big fish would then be the predator. And these would be the prey. So it's entirely possible that you can be a predator in it. Now your niche is your very specific habitat where you live. It's your particular role in the community. No one else 
has this particular role that you have or your species has. Okay. Um, this has a picture of these barnacles, and it's a it's a really really famous study on um, niche. Some people call it niche. Um, and basically, your fundamental niche is the one that you could occupy if there was no competition. So, for example, um, this Chithalamus barnacle, this brown barnacle, um, he can actually live in this entire environment. Okay, if, if there were no balanced barnacles, the blue ones, the chimps would live in the entire thing. Right, so the entire thing would be um, the fundamental niche. Um, this chip balance particle. Okay, the so realized niche is the actual niche that you occupy with competition. So if balance goes up, balance is actually a better competitor in the wet areas of the environment. Okay, where it's really wet. Um, but balanus cannot handle being up, up near the high tide line. It's too dry. Balanus cannot survive. So what happens is balanus ends up taking up this whole area that he can actually live in and pushing the chithalamus into this little area because he can survive, you know, in this entire area. But balanus outcompetes him in the lower area. And so chithalamus hangs out up high. Um, right where the zero is, and then balance comes out below. Now, if balance were to go away, just balance again would, would um, occupy his entire fundamental niche. So, symbiosis is when two species live in very close association with one another. There's a couple different types of symbiosis um, that we can talk about. Um, a clownfish and a sea anemone is a very common one. Um, basically, the sea anemone is um, stings, um, and so since the sea anemone stings, it keeps predators from the clownfish. And then um, the clownfish is a type of damselfish, and damselfish are actually, you know, for their size, they're probably, you know, the size of your pinky finger, maybe a little smaller. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the size, they're pretty, they're pretty feisty. And so this, the, the clownfish will actually bite or chase away predators of the sea anemone. So um, the clownfish gets a nice little safe place to hide, that, um, you know, a little house that also stings. Um, and then the sea anemone gets a nice little like guard dog, basically in the form of the clownfish. So that's a, um, that one is called a mutualism, and that's because both of them benefit. Okay, so some people will call a mutualism like a plus plus because both species um, benefit. Um, parasitism is when one organism feeds on another. Um, so one is going to harm the other. So they get, um, one gets a benefit, the parasite, and whatever the host is, the thing that it's, it's living on, the um, is, is harmed. Okay, so an example of a parasite could be a disease um, or like a, uh, a bacterial infection you might get um, because it's going to hurt you, but then it's going to help that you're, you're basically the bacteria is feeding on you um, or something like that, or a tick, right? If you've got a tick, a tick would be feeding on you, but it's also going to hurt you. Um, so it's, it's hurting you, but it's, it's helpful to the tip of the And then a commensalism is when that one is benefited and the other doesn't really care. Um, so t sometimes they call this, like they'll put a zero here, or they'll put like a equal sign. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, so an example of a commensalism, um, you may have seen like stingrays. I can, I can draw this. Okay. Stingray kind of looks like this, right? And if this is the underside of the stingray, they have like that. And these little areas of the gills. Well, there's these little fish that attach themselves to the bottom of the stingray. It's called remora. Um, and they get a nice little free ride. They eat um, the mouth of the stingray is right here. And so they eat, um, they like stingrays are messy. 
so they'll eat like the leftovers of the stingrays and stuff like that. And the stingray doesn't really care. They don't get a better. It doesn't really. They don't even care less about the remorse. So the remorse is getting a benefit of getting this free ride and the leftovers that the stingray eats. And the stingray, you know, doesn't really care who they think they're there. So that would be a cancelism. Um, now, uh, biodiversity. So the biodiversity is the variety of organisms living in a place. And that's important, the variety. Okay, how many different kinds? Um, the more variety or the greater species richness. So species richness is just like a science way of saying variety. So if you have, let's say, let's say this coral reef in this picture, uh, all of the only fish that lived on this coral reef are these yellow fish. That, um, that environment would have a lot of fish, but it wouldn't be very biodiverse because it only has the yellow fish. Now, if there's lots of different kind of fish that live on this coral reef, which is what you really have is, it's a very biodiverse coral reef, it has a high species richness, and so it's usually they consider it like to be more resilient um, or, or um, it can survive problems a little easier a lot of times. Um, and in general, the tropics have a higher biodiversity than higher latitudes. And this is just because it's warmer. Some more creatures can live there. Um, you have to be very highly adapted to live in cold, cold weather. Um, so now we can talk about succession, which is the replacement of one type of community by another at a single location over time. Okay, um, the first thing you're going to get is um, succession starts with the bare soil. Okay, you see there's no plants, nothing. Bare soil. Okay, and this would be, this would be actually secondary succession because you actually at least have some soil. Um, if you don't have any soil primary succession, the ground is going to be rocks. Like in Hawaii, where they're having that um, the lava spill, right? Um, the lava is actually filled in a tide pool. And so now the ground there is lava. When that dries and stuff starts growing on that lava, that would be primary succession because that lava has not previously supported life. That lava is brand new rock, basically. Brand new um, place for things to live. Um, so you're going to start with nothing, and then you're going to get little grasses and things like that. Then you may get some shrubs and shrubs and trees and then really big trees. Um, this, this takes time. If you've ever seen, like, um, for example, when I was in college, um, the place where I work, they have like a trailer because they didn't have enough build, building space. And then they, um, the trailer was like rotten or something. So they took it away. And then there was this just like a flat of dirt um, where the trailer had lived. There was no plants on that or anything. There was just a flat patch of dirt. And then like as the weeks went by, weedy grasses started kind of showing up there. And then, you know, more and more and more grass. If we were to go back now, it would probably be, you know, full of grass. And if they would let it, it would have probably had some shrubs and some little trees and things like that. It definitely wouldn't be enough to have, like, uh, large trees yet. But, um, you know, stuff started growing there. So maybe you might have seen that as well, like, if you have, like, a dirty patch, like a dirt patch in your yard, and then weeds start kind of growing there, and then, you know, on and on and on. Um, so this is just a big picture of what I was talking about. Um, so let's talk about who lives where. Um, what determines where you live? Um, the biggest thing that determines where you live is your climate. Okay, that's what your temperature and your rainfall is your climate. Okay, and that's the biggest thing that determines who lives where is your climate. Because you can't live anywhere if your climate is not... Um, suitable for you. If it's too hot or too cold, not enough rain. Um, and then once you get to your climate, basically, then there's some biotic factors that determine exactly where within that climate you live. And that would be your predators and your prey. You know, who's going to eat you? Um, if there's someone that's going to eat you, you may want to not want to live near those folks or whatever they are. And um, you want to live close to things that you eat. All right. 
the problem is, is predator. If um, if you're the if you're the prey of a predator, the predator will live near you because they eat you. But then you want to live near your prey because you're the predator of your prey. And so you want to live near, you. and that's why things kind of tend to live near by each other. You know, you'll see similar things in the same environment because just as you're trying to get near your prey, whoever eats you is trying to get near you because you're you're its prey. Um, and then we can talk about populations. Um, a population is a group of organisms of the same species, and that's really important. Same species, and a species means that you basically need to get and reproduce with one another and produce viable offspring. Okay, so humans would be a population. Um, all of the humans in the world would be a population, a human population. And then the density is how crowded your population is. So if you're a population and you live in a city, maybe you live downtown Atlanta, right? You might be in a very dense area. But let's say you live kind of out, I do, you know, it's, it's a little more country, it's not going to be as dense. Okay, and then we talk about carrying capacity. So, um, carrying capacity is the maximum number of organisms that can be supported by your environment, and it basically causes competition. There's some sort of limiting factor in your environment, and that's what causes um, your carrying capacity. So, it's not always the same thing. Like, your carrying capacity may be your food, your carrying capacity might be the amount of habitat. It just depends. Um, and you can see here, I've kind of drawn them in orange. Um, the carrying capacity, I just found this graph online. And um, so basically, the, the population goes really fast right here. And then as it reaches the carrying capacity, it starts going slower and slower, and it just kind of like hits the carrying capacity. Okay, same with this one. It's going to grow the fastest right here, and then it's going to slow down as it hits the carrying capacity. Same here, going fast. And then this one, um, what it did is it um, increased and then actually decreased a little bit, um, which is just some populations do that. So we, we talked about this right interdependence on the first slide, and now we're talking about interconnectedness. So the entire planet is connected through the oceans and the atmosphere, right? Um, there's, there's, we label the oceans differently, but they're all basically one ocean. They're all connected. Same with the atmosphere. Um, there was a in uh, in the Ukraine in the 80s, um, it was 1989, uh, a nuclear power plant called Chernobyl um, exploded and released a bunch of radioactive material into the environment. Um, if you go back and look at news reports um, during that time, the actual, like in France, for example, the on the news, they said, don't worry, you don't have to worry, it's not going to come into our atmosphere. It's basically almost like there was a wall all the way up to the sky, like, you know, if it's if it's going to come in, it's it's the whole atmosphere is interconnected. So it's it's very you can't really say like just because it happened over there doesn't mean it's going to happen over there. that that their bad air quality isn't going to get here because of that. Um, and the problem is is we don't know enough about how everything interacts to to really make choices on species like oh we can get rid of this one because nobody cared about this one and, and it has no ecological niche, right? Well, maybe we just don't know about it, right? We don't know enough about the environment exactly who eats that critter or why that critter is important. Um, so these are some ecological problems. Um, if we take environmental science, those help a lot more, but these are some big basic ones. Um, the ozone layer, it basically protects us from the sun's radiation. Um, this dark part right here, this is this is the ozone hole, um, where it's like black. That's basically where there's like basically no ozone. Um, the ozone hole is in a layer um, over Antarctica. Um, it's growing. Um, the problem is the CFCs, protonal carbons, they're illegal now. But um, what happened is that once they get into the environment, they form this like chain reaction of basically eating ozone. And so even though we stop using fluorofluorocarbons, um, the chlorine molecules are still in the environment doing that chain reaction that eats ozone. We've slowed it down, but it's still there. Um, the next issue is global warming. 
um, average global temperature. Now they call, like to call it climate change, so I'll, I'll switch it to climate change to be more politically correct. Okay, um, and basically the average global temperature is increasing. Um, and so, um, and this is this is over the entire planet. Okay, um, and so some places will have colder weather, some places will have warmer weather, but overall, the um, Earth's temperature is increasing. And basically, the main cause of this is uh, burning fossil fuels, it produces CO2. Um, there's a few greenhouse gases, for example, methane is the worst greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, but carbon dioxide is, is by far um, the most common greenhouse gas that's emitted, so it's um, basically the cause. And um, you know, you can look at charts. We have we have data where you can see like um, the CO2 um, concentration in the atmosphere increases, and right behind it is a lag effect. The temperature kind of starts increasing. Um, so another issue is acid rain. And basically, um, air pollutants combine with water in the atmosphere to cause rain with a pH of less than seven. Now, granted, um, rain is usually has a pH a little less than seven because um, the CO2 um, in the atmosphere reacts with water and forms our carbonic acid, which means it's a little bit acidic. But the problem with acid rain is when we burn fossil fuels, we release uh, sulfur oxides and nitrogen oxides, and those form sulfuric acid and, and nitric acid, and those really reduce the pH to around like five, which um, is pretty low. Um, this can cause fish tree and other organism death. It can really cause problems in the soil. Um, it can degrade buildings, all sorts of stuff. The biggest, biggest, biggest issue is uh, habitat destruction. Um, it can cause extinction, which is the death of every member of the system. No one in that species is left, not one single person or individual. Um, deforestation, and clearing forests for timber, and invasive species. Um, near animals that come into the environment, they don't belong there, and they disrupt the food web. So these bottom two, these are, uh, these are green muscles. Study these in college. Both in Asia. They're being Florida now. And this is um it's like mm, it's a type of invasive weed. Um an aquatic weed. I used to work on these two. There there was a time when uh I knew exactly what they, what they were, uh, but I can't remember. Um, and basically, they come into an environment, they have no competitors, they have no predators, nothing, and they're usually very generalist, so that means they're not very, they don't really care where they live, it's pretty easy going, and so they just kind of like take over because there's nothing to eat them. They eat lots of things. They're not really particular about where they eat. They're not really particular about where they live. And so they just kind of take over everything. Um, the next is soil erosion. Um, erosion due to humans is an increasing problem. Um, when we cut down forests, we leave earth bare or soil bare, and that makes it more easy to erode. Um, when we plant, um, Crops and then when we, um, you know, in between the crops, in between plantings, there's just bare soil. Again, that's a way that it can erode. Um, if we irrigate too much, that can cause, you know, the soil to uh, run off. And so, some ways that we soil, uh, we conserve soil, we terrace. That's what you see here. These are, these are terraces. It's basically taking a hill. Turning it in stair steps and planting crops on the stair steps. So it's less likely to erode. But if you plant your crops here when it rains, you know, it's going to erode. And here it's just kind of in the air, it's not going to erode as well. Um, crop rotation this is switching the crops at one time, you use this 
uh, crop and other times we use this crop. Um, if we get two crops, we don't lose the nutrients. You won't deplete the soil as quickly. Um, you can contour plow. So again, if you've got a mountain, um, if you plant your rows like this, it's going to be a lot easier for the rain to run off. Where if you have a mountain, and you plant your rows like this, uh, the terrace the rains, you know, it's not going to be running off with the um, with your rows. Um, and then resource use. So a renewable resource is something that is replaced at the same rate in which it's consumed. Okay, this is um, something that can replenish itself. They call it, we can use it at a sustainable level. It's sustainable. Teach environmental science and uh, sustainable is like really like big buzzword. Um, wind energy, solar energy, trees can be sustainable, but you must replant them. If you cut down trees faster than you're using them, then they're not sustainable anymore. Um, and sustainability is just the, basically the ability to meet human needs in a way that the population of the resource can survive indefinitely. And then a non-renewable resource forms at a rate much slower than they are consumed. So for example, we are catching fish out of the ocean faster than um, they can replenish themselves. So it's great they are non-renewable or non-sustainable. Um, fossil fuels, they um, take millions and millions of years to form, and we are using them very quickly. So we are using them so much faster than they can form that they are considered non-renewable as well. And then um, the last thing, conservation and restoration. Um, conservation is when you want to identify, manage, and protect areas. Um, so conservation is something that you do before a problem happens. To kind of keep it nice. And restoration is when we're trying to fix something. So it's it's already messed up. And we need to fix it. Um, usually it is cheaper to just conserve something in the first place than to try and restore it. And um, that's the last thing I have for you guys uh, for ecology.